Right, right. So, so what I found interesting about the panel was the, the you know the range of discussion, and I was surprised by the topics that people brought up. So, you know, when I began, I thought people would talk a lot about service ecosystems generally and thinking about the human computation angles and you know why that's changing, uh, how computing is viewed, you know why programming human computations is difficult. But it ended up people also talked about the broader sort of the more current social uh, setting of it in terms of you know should. Uh, you know, sh should uh, computer scientists be trying to innovate, start companies? Should computer scientists be, you know, even completing college? Uh, you know, and I, I thought even, you know, whether old people should be involved, or young people should be involved in computing. So in a way, the topic has this uh, natural ring to it, where it uh, goes beyond, uh, you know, traditional sort of academic or even researchy views of uh, computing into, you know, how computing fits into the real world. Uh, so while we're waiting, uh, let me introduce the uh, the panelists. So uh, with me, there are uh, four people here today. Uh, and I'll list them in alphabetical order. Uh, this is uh, Professor Aditya Ghosh from uh, the University of Wollongong, Australia. Can you wave at the audience? Uh, the next person alphabetically is Professor Ling Lu from Georgia Tech. Um, the next one is uh, Dr. Uh, Michael uh, Maximilian, also known as Max, from IBM Research in Almaden. And the next one alphabetically is uh, Dr. Hamid Reza Mozahari Nejad from uh, Hewlett Packard Labs in, in Palo Alto. I'd like to now turn it over to the audience uh, to ask questions and also along the way even to the panelists to ask each other questions. But with a preference for the audience. So any takers? Um, while he was speaking, I was thinking, why isn't he telling Microsoft? And then I thought, Microsoft is not about helping their users. Microsoft is about disadvantaging the competition. And so my question is, can you build into your calculus of management the uh, concept of competition? Absolutely. The answer is very simply yes. And in fact, you would have heard a lot of my fellow panelists mention the same thing. So the idea is that we're looking at an ecosystem and something that I was planning to hassle Muninder and Hamid and Ling and possibly Max, although he didn't really mention it, but I could have still hassled him, was the idea that you know, whenever you look at an ecosystem, the fundamental characteristic of an ecosystem is competition. And you have to characterize competition. And characterizing competition, amongst other things, means that whenever there's competition, something works out in the end. That the thing that works out in the end is the equilibrium. Right? And the idea is that we should be able to, at some point, mathematically characterize the equilibria that emerge from these ecosystems. And your reference to Microsoft is an instance of, you know, that's how the dominoes played out. Right? So, so I think, yes, competition is fundamental. The formal characterization of competition is fundamental. Without it, we won't have any of this. But maybe what we do have is an equilibrium. It's just that you know, equilibria are not guaranteed to be desirable. Right? I mean, there's a classic prisoner's dilemma. You know, it has an equilibrium like any other game, but it's not the equilibrium you want. And maybe the equilibrium we have today is, um, I won't take any corporate sides, but you know, with some companies doing what they, what you might, might have wanted to do. One thing to say you know, yeah, also is that the cloud is sort of democratizing the field so that anybody here can actually start a new company and be in some ways competitive with Microsoft or IBM. Partly because, you know, uh, with the cloud you can sort of scale if you do it right, you have your, the right DevOps, you can scale pretty much infinitely. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, is that there's only a few players providing the cloud resources. Uh, and I think in that particular space, there is a sort of set of dominant players. If you already are in relationship with, uh, with one of the service providers, then you see a better offer, bit, better deal coming along. So uh, what are, in this model that we are offering, what are the provisions for service substitution as well as cost of change? Because there are a lot of things that, you know, a change may not be as easy as, um, as we thought. And I'm, I'm not sure how these things can be considered in the, in the model. So I want to uh, promote the crowdsourcing again. So with cloud computing, um, if you start a company, you need a really a top technician who knows how to uh, set up a server in the cloud. And if you are going with public cloud, you need a lot of experience in system tuning, performing to handle the peak performance. But if you are a small company, you have a big ambition, you want to do something to change the world, then you should start looking at the possibility of utilizing the crowd. 
because uh, there are many, many people who are bored, who are interested in actually uh, do something interesting, and, uh, and who are actually, you don't even need them to be very highly educated, and they could help you with a lot of things. And uh, another thing that are really interesting with crowdsourcing recently is uh, people looking at the big data technology, they are also combining with crowdsourcing. Because with the big data, one of the problem with machine learning is you don't have enough seed data to do it, to do learning. So that's why I said it's uh, something interesting for researchers who don't have a lot of uh, dollars and resources to work on and testing your ideas. You are largely covering how technology changes. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have any insights how our profession changes. And you've been asking uh, about advices for PhD students, democratizing cloud, etc. cetera. Uh, what about the kids dropping high school to start businesses? I would say drop get to college and then drop you know, that to start a business. Because then you have a lot of models, right? You have Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, and so on. Um, um, I, I do think, though, that, that you know, early on, I mean, it, I, I don't have children, but it, I think if I, if I did and they showed any interest in computer science, I would get them to start programming right now. Because hacking is, is really what, you know, most of you should be. I almost feel like, you know, it should be a requirement as part of getting into a computer science program, is to have learned how to hack. Because I look at, I look at you know, from my experience at IBM, right? And at IBM Research, lots of really smart people, some of my colleagues are here, and that you can sort of absorb new ideas, work with different people, and, and get it out. So I think that's the change, right? And, and it's sort of this notion of hacking as being something bad and having very formal processes to build software to something that's more agile. And it's so, point, it's so agile now that it's anybody that can hack, that can put something together, can actually build a company because now with the cloud, the resources, the servers that you needed before, that you would have to spend some capital investment, you no longer need that. So I think that's the change, right? And I think for, you know, if you're a professor or you're, you, you know, you're teaching at a university, I think you've got to sort of insist on that. I tell kids is uh, this might be the most interesting time ever to be a computer scientist. Um, and one of the reasons why that is the case was touched on by a bunch of us on the panel. Take the idea of human computation that uh, I think uh, Ling just talked about, crowdsourcing and so on. Amit talked about, um, and, and Munindar and I, and, and to a lesser extent Max has also mentioned. The, you know, yesterday on the plane I was looking at a paper, I just dug this up because of this panel, a paper that's proposing a programming language for human computation. And you know, I've been toying with this idea, so I was telling kids some time back, you know, Imagine that I'm going to devise a programming language, you know, basic, so I'm going to devise a programming language of programming humans. What's it going to look like? So they said, well, it'll say take two steps forward, turn right, and so on. And I said, well, that's true. Um, that's, that's their perspective. But really, I mean, if you think about it and if you want to take that pitch to, to kids and to, to take the prospect of becoming, let's say, a computer scientist to them, that's really interesting. I mean, so can I take a traditional programming language and say that's a human programming language? Is it going to be a business process model? That's actually a question I was going to ask my fellow panelists as well. And really interesting questions coming up that were never asked before in our discipline. So for those reasons, I think it's really challenging and interesting. Um, uh, on your uh, first uh, question, uh, how it changes basically the profession as a whole, uh, again, from a, an enterprise point of view, um, the fact that we have private, uh, private cloud, uh, public cloud, and um, uh, traditional IT, that enterprise IT at some point, they were responsible for to putting together all the compute, all the basically resources to offer to the whole enterprise. They needed to be computer scientists. But because their, cha their job is now changing to portfolio manager, who, whose resources to acquire. So they become portfolio managers for IT services. So they need a kind of new set of uh, skill set. It may not be about really writing programs. Writing programs may go uh, to uh, cloud services or other small providers that are actually providing the uh, services. But for a lot of consumers, the set of, set of skill set that is needed in enterprise IT division is about uh, managing the resources managing the service portfolio, 
and optimizing it, demand management for, for the enterprise. So we are seeing a big shift in the role of people uh, and in the skill set that they need in enterprise IT over the next few years. That's my perspective on that. So what I think that are most fascinating for, the, for this, all these uh, innovations from uh, a web, web services, and uh, cloud computing, social network, and crowdsourcing, big data, it's actually the innovation. So from very little, the kids now learn how to play games, learn how to join the social network, to talk to their own peers. And this kind of phenomenon can teach them to learn to innovate more. And I think uh, the, the, the next challenge for educators is really, what are the kind of uh, models that we can teach kids how to innovate from very young age? Because for example, if you take the crowdsourcing, there are companies like SWIP, and the ISWAP, they actually utilizing the gameplay to try to encourage people to join the crowdsourcing to help with, uh, a, a, with the, the crowdsourcing tasks and by playing games. And if you see the kids who are now like a, a six, seven years old, if you look at the kids five years old, they play iPad in the restaurant, okay? So those are the kids who are very young age exposed with technology. So they may have a lot more imaginations that actually can actually help the next generation of technology. You know, the reason why IT technology, CS technology going this far is actually because of every step innovation, every two or three years we have another innovation. So this chain of uh, innovation actually lead all of us has, a, has exciting times now. So I want to disagree with all my colleagues here because I think, and, and with Dehan. I think it's, uh, it's common to ask this question about you know, young kids doing stuff, and I have nothing against young kids, but I think the, the, the fundamental value of the things you're talking about is that it's lowering the barriers to entry. And that's good for young kids, but it's also good for old, old people. You know? uh, in other words, I mean, the, the specific thing I see is that what matters now for understanding solutions is you know, intimacy with the domain. Earlier in computer science, you had to be good at you know, COBOL and Fortran and Java, JavaScript you know, t technology. But now I think the successes are coming from knowing the domain more. And we see people dropping out of college because that's the demographic which has intimacy with domains like you know, Facebook, as, a, as an example. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, gaming and so on. But just uh, when we lower the barrier of entry, maybe there'll be people who'll be 70 years old who'll have great intimacy with you know, the way in which some healthcare thing ought to be done because they really understand it. And they might be able to adopt cloud computing to solve a problem which nobody else has been able to solve before. So there's really no reason why you know, it should be kids all the way. One of the things that struck me as interesting is that none of you thought that the PhD students should be taking any business courses given the fact that we find that uh, the uh, rate of cloud adoption is directly tied to the ability to develop business models for the solution. I want to put the thread on this economics thing associated with crowdsourcing and social computing. One of the trends that we're finding is that people who now have a predisposition for giving away their data for free are starting to try to drive a development of a revenue stream associated with their data that they are now giving away for free. And I was wondering whether you think that this is going to have a negative impact on the cost reduction and the, uh, the, the economics associated with this use of social networking crowdsourcing if people are, are now expecting to get paid for the data and, and information that they give away for free now. Part of your question, I'll, I guess I'll try to answer uh, aspects of it. So first thing is that I, I, when I finished my PhD, I was thinking, oh, man, I should go and get a business degree because then I could learn. The reality is you can learn all of these business aspects on the job. The problem is we don't all learn at the same pace in the same way. So it might take you know, more um, management skills by trying to get into the management track. You might need to read more books about management or take some classes and so on. But from a business perspective, I think you know, going to get an MBA after you have a PhD, not worth it. Um, go open your business, learn on a job, right? Or go into a big company like IBM or HP and, and, and go to the management uh, ranks and learn that way. Now for your other question, um, I think I, I'm not an expert in big data, but I've worked with a lot of people doing big data. And what I've seen is everybody says, I'm going to open a business or I'm going to 
figure out the value from the data. And I would say, I would guess that 80% never actually get any value. The problem is it's hard. It's very, very hard to figure out where the value is in a huge amount of data. So there's lots more research that needs to be done there. So what I would advise people is stop thinking of giving it away for free. Right? Why is it that the first thing that people start thinking in the past five years is you're going to start an application, you're going to have a little app on the web, the, the app store, and you're going to give it away for free. If you look at the most successful businesses, companies uh, today, Apple, when was the last time Apple gave anything away for free? Right? I mean, if you do, let me know because I will go and get it. Uh, when was the last time we gave anything away for free, IBM? We don't. And we're not ashamed of it because we give you value by getting you to pay for it. So I think even from a perspective of data, you shouldn't start by thinking that I'm going to do something and give it away for free in the data. So basically what, what's, what's, what's been happening is the companies like, the, let's say, like Facebook or Twitter, they give away the service for free. You and I use it, and we become the product. We are the product. We, we essentially are using that service because it's free, and we give away our privacy and our data and so on. And they try to figure out a way to make money out of that by essentially charging other people. What I'm saying is maybe it has to be more balanced where, you know, I offer you a service, let's say a Twitter-like service, and I charge you. So that way, I don't have to go and figure out how to make money from that data, which is very hard. And also, I can sort of protect your privacy and protect the data. Well, if they charge you too, they'll charge you for it. So, yeah. yeah, so I want to mention one thing. Um, I disagree with Michael. I don't have a problem for a company to keep things secrecy. But I think if you look at the entire internet innovation, and wave after wave, actually they're all driven by open access by um, people who are actually, um, this, this kind of openness, the open source, open data, that actually dri drives a lot of innovation. So as academics, I will continue to encourage people to open um, your, da your data, open your, your, your code, and create this uh, culture of, uh, of, of innovation. And uh, for companies, if you want to keep it secrecy because you're a company business, that's fine, go ahead, do that. Right? But we need, we still need people who embrace this openness. Okay, Facebook, and they're, when they started, they are actually open a lot of things. Nowadays, they start closing, they started putting a lot of things, they started intruding the, a, the privacy of the members. That's because they are now a real company now, right? So, so, so things is, uh, that's one thing. Second words, thing, second never thing. Never gonna happen. No. <laughs> second thing I want to, I want to mention, no, it's, it's happening, okay? Look at the amount of uh, open data. You see, what data set people study the most is RDF data. Why? Because there's a huge amount of RDF open source out there under open data initiative. Why people are not studying companies' web blogs? Because they don't open it. Can I give you then an forget example? about it. OK, so <laughs> a simple example, Netflix. They open their data, give it to the community to, hey, go figure out better recommendation system. What happened? I mean, they, they learn a little bit, but they got huge controversy because people would figure out, you know, based on the data, even though it's anonymized, you know, what pattern, they, they figure out who that person was that rented that, that, uh, those, those DVDs. So the problem is, too, from a company perspective, liability is too huge. So the simple answer is we will never, you will never see the trend of opening the data be very, very, uh, you know, uh, trendy. It's not going to happen. Yeah, my so is my it's too, it's too I huge. agree and disagree with some parts of my uh, colleagues. I disagree with Max on the fact that companies should not give uh, things for free. But the answer to that coming to your question is about sharing what you can make out of that. So there are models on that. And I disagree with the second part of the statement that everything has to be uh, public because personal data is not public, so you cannot basically uh, publish personal data, address of people because we have open data, open uh, policy data. So everything, so open uh, data works for something, but I not for others. I think that is you take it to, to the extreme. Okay, of course we are not going to open all the personal data, but there are lots of data can be open, and the people yes. are not opening it. 
So look at RDF data. Why there are so many people study that? Why the RDF system getting a, a advanced a lot more? Because I agree that it works. Access. It worked for some time. Yeah, but <laughs> but the main question to get to your question, there is a you know there is a very interesting line of work in how to actually uh, ma uh, make or uh, have models with these companies like Facebook, Twitter, and others who make money out of you and uh, me, uh, my data to share that. And basically, there is research going on on creating marketplaces where you bet you kind of you put your own personal data up for sale. Say, I collect five dollar bonds, sixty cents a month, or hundred dollar uh, a month, basically based uh, based on the what the what the what the market value of it, and I share this this my data with you. And uh, so I'm not on the economic side, but I was talking to a professor at MIT uh, two months ago who they are basically pushing for having recognition of the right of ownership of personal data in the World Economic Forum. And they have already passed that. They are trying to push uh, the first uh, company uh, that they are trying to make it accept is Facebook. They accepted part of it, but not all of it. It will not be um, uh, very long from now that we will see that uh, pers uh, uh, personal data uh, or people on the internet will own their data and they will have some tools. N not all of people may actively go and uh, manage it, but they have some rights or some tools to be able to do that. And that's the right to me to have. So it seems we are mainly about the like high level or how to leverage these kind of existing technologies. But uh, the basic things like uh, problem diagnosis, the root cause, all this, we, we actually discussed that uh, Every day in our, in our research center, we find that uh, we are still using like a Bayesian network, this kind of uh, technology which has been 70 years or 100 years ago. So, so it's very hard, it seems. So I don't know how far we can go. I mean, maybe the pro hard problems in the management will remain hard after 10 years. And uh, so, I, I, so I don't know. Yeah, that's if you take the mathematical theory, and there are many, many traditional algorithms, and, uh, but as the computing moves from uh, a centralized to distributed and then centralized back and to more distributed, actually a lot of algorithms are facing the challenge. For example, if you take the Bayesian network or take any kind of uh, a machine learning algorithm, there are memory algorithms. They cannot run in a distributed environment. And uh, if you want to really have a large amount of data, the big data cannot hold in one single server's memory, then what are you going to do? Even you can run, you can, you can have a nice, elegant algorithm, but you cannot run on the big data. You fail. So as a researchers, data scientists, system researchers, they have to figure out a way how to partition the computation, how to partition the data that keeps the data consistency while running the traditional elegant mathematical algorithms. So there are many, many challenges because of the big data, because of the massive collaboration, massive server, um, a computation that requires lots, lots of uh, a new innovation, new re visit, revisit of the existing a uh, elegant uh, mathematical algorithms that can only run in my memory. Okay, and our computing technology today, we can still not have enough memory. And then you want to buy a machine with hun 100 to, uh, 100 to, once 128 gigabytes of memory, you can really find it easily. Okay. So what you end up doing is you're going to have to partition your algorithms. You have to keep the speed, and you have to partition your algorithm, partition your data. Once you partition data, the algorithm doesn't work anymore because a lot of data requires a, a, a global feature. So how do you do that? So there are lots of uh, challenges in the new, um, in the new, um, new big data technology, a, 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 a cloud computing, and crowdsourcing. So actually, it's a very interesting challenge for for any researcher, for researchers who are doing system research, for researchers doing big data research, for researchers doing data analytic research, you should be proud of your own field, but you don't have to jump to other people's field. If you're a system researcher, stay there, because there's many, many interesting research challenges that uh, data mining research cannot solve. Machine learning researcher cannot solve at all. Without you, they are not able to put their things on the market. So that's why I think everybody has a big, a, a contribution in this uh, this playground.
know, how do you actually have programs that take advantage of this that, that you know, are not very, uh, you know, energy, that are very energy efficient, that take advantage of the multiple cores. So there's lots of challenges. So if you're looking to be, you know, if you're looking to have the next Turing, uh, you know, candidate, uh, nobody can really approach him, uh, that's an area to, to focus on. But in general, what I would say is, you know, none of us here are going to be Alan Turing, right? Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, maybe one of us has a chance, right? Maybe, but probably not. So instead, why don't you try to become the next Mark Zuckerberg, which essentially, you know, nothing, you know, to say Mark Zuckerberg is so amazing, but what, what happened is that he took all of these ideas that people have been doing and created something that has a lot of value. Why? Because I can guarantee you, every one of you here know who he is, has a Facebook account, and use it. Probably, right? Let me, 99%. One guy is shaking his head. Who else is not? Right, you see? Okay, so two, right? So the point is, the point is, he has changed the world, right? Just like Alan Turing did. So be the next Mark Zuckerberg, apply, and if you build something very interesting, then maybe you can, uh, you know, step aside and start thinking about the deeper questions. So use that time to build something that's useful. I think that's the key. So um, regarding service ecosystem, we have to recognize one thing, that it's a complex network of services and people. And when looking at it from a theoretical uh, framework perspective, to me, what is new compared to all existing framework that is out there is the involvement of human there. And there are two major characteristics of human action. One, they make decision at the point that work is get done. So there is a need for flexibility, taking it into account the human at, at that point. And the second point is it's a social, uh, human are uh, uh, inherently social. So taking these two into account, if we are going to put uh, or uh, invent any or extend any um, existing theoretical framework for service ecosystem, that uh, type of framework should be flexible enough to put the human in control, not the machine. Because so many other times we have put flex, uh, theory in, in input uh, like uh, in, in control, like uh, in workflow systems, in other type of complex system, we have always put machine in control. Now we have to put human in control to make Every, uh, everything in the service uh, ecosystem to work toward the successful sol solution to solve the problem. If uh, my fellow panelists or anybody in this audience over the course of this conference can give me ideas on how we might program human computation, I'd be very interested. That's one. The second thing was, um, you know, if, if you look at operating systems, we started from a model of the operating system on your desktop to a model of the internet as the operating system to a model, I think, that is emerging where society itself is the operating system. And when I say that, you'll stop and say, well, hang on, wasn't that always the case? And the answer is, of course, it was. But can we understand it better now? Can we leverage it better now? If you can give me insights on that, I'd be very grateful as well. So these are the two thoughts for me that will intrigue me for the rest of this conference, if you can help me. Thanks. And from my perspective, you know, what makes the study unique is that uh, compared to traditional uh, computer science, this is the, an opportunity for us to talk about open systems for the first time. So traditionally we think of stakeholders outside and then some artifact that we spend our time on. But now we're talking about systems where the stakeholders are part of the, part of the package. And that's why it brings in all the attendant problems of human society, the challenges of you know, uh, economics and so on to uh, develop and uh, administer and guide such ecosystems. I think that's what makes it an intellectually uh, exciting area and I hope also one of uh, great uh, business value. So, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank the panelists and the audience and uh, declare the panel closed. Thank you. <laughs>